So, um, there is a lot of tech development going on right now uh, in the name of the common good. And by that term, I'm referring to technologies such as AI, automation, and assistive technologies that are used to support decisions in healthcare, medicine, and public sector. And these are areas where being the subject to technology is rarely truly optional. And it also uh, includes high stakes decisions. It is questions such as, will I get that welfare benefit so that I can feed my kids? Or will I get the correct diagnosis? Or will I get the treatment that could save my life? And these are the kinds of questions which are increasingly being made uh, by technology. And I think we need to talk more about that. And these are also areas where the use of technology could have very harmful effects, as we have also been talking about in the previous talks today, for example. Um, but it's also areas where the use of technology could have huge potential benefits. But these kinds of grand claims, I think, need to be balanced by a closer look at what kind of human-technology relations are created uh, when we use these kinds of new technologies. Now we'll be talking about AI and healthcare, but I am not a clinician, and I'm not a medical scholar, and I'm also not an AI developer. I'm a sociologist of science and technology and human technology relations um, and the governance of technology. But I work in interdisciplinary teams together with medical scholars and medical practitioners and um, computer scientists and other experts trying to figure out what the potentials and the pitfalls are for AI in health. And right now, um, our AI is argued to be reshaping medicine as we know it in many ways. And these are kind of uh, huge promises in many ways. Uh, it is argued that it can improve the disease detection in different ways, that it can speed up and improve the diagnosis of disease, and also that it can offer more precision in the prognosis of diseases. And a lot of this has to do with the processing of information, of course, like a pr processing of multiple data points in a short amount of time, in a way that no human can do. And time is often of essence when we talk about medicine and healthcare, of course. But doctors have for a long time been considering multiple data points when they make their decisions, of course. Yet AI is argued to be, in different ways, making it possible for clinicians to amplify their abilities. And one area in the forefront of AI development is AI in medical imaging. And I'm particularly invested in the area of AI in mammography screening. And here we have deep learning technologies and convolutional neural networks that are applied to the images from the screening process, trying to figure out the likelihood that a cancer is present in the image. And the AI systems can also offer risk scores that can ease the triage process for the radiologist. And they can also mark the suspicious findings, such as uh, calcifications and lesions in the images. Um, but in general, when we talk about AI in medicine, there are many of these kinds of great advances at the research stage, but not a lot of it is tested in the real world clinical setting. One exception to that is a study that was published earlier this summer in the Lancet Oncology by a team that I'm involved in. And it was the first results from the Maasai trial, Maasai standing for mammography screening with artificial intelligence. Uh, and it's a clinical perspective trial, meaning that it's not performed on historical data, but on screening as it is performed in the clinic. And this study the first results of it is showing that the AI-supported screening, by the use of that, additional cancers were found, and the workload by the radiologists were heavily reduced. And this publication generated quite a lot of media attention. So I tried to follow that a little bit, like the news outlets post in social media, and see what kind of remarks it got. Uh, and there were quite a few uh, in line with this one, like, turns out we don't need radiologists no more, or please let AI be my doctor. Uh, and I would argue that this is 
a misinterpretation of the study, but also a misinterpretation of the best use uh, of AI in health. First of all, the study, what, what was actually done was uh, letting the AI system classify the images into low-risk cases, which was read by AI plus one human radiologist, and high-risk cases, which was read by AI and two human radiologists. And that was compared with the standard of care in Sweden, which is that every image is read by two human radiologists. And in that sense, it wasn't really about AI versus human, and more, I would argue, uh, a case of human technology amplification, a case of where we can use technology perhaps to amplify the human medical abilities by pairing these kind of computer vision and technologies and the capabilities they bring together with the human radiologist site, their medical knowledge, their long expertise often, and foremost also their human critical judgment. And we also did a survey on the Swedish press radiologists trying to figure out, well, what do they think about this development? Um, and a large majority of them were positive about integrating AI into the screening. Uh, and one did, did uh, offer us also this comment that it feels good to be able to be supported by AI in the screening. It could be nice to have a second reader, AI, who never loses concentration. And considering the screening volumes and the scarcity of breast radiologists, it feels good that AI can complement us. And this speaks about the perceived qualities of AI in this setting. Of course, we should also ask ourselves, like, wh why, why is why is it that medical staff are so short of time or like all these kind of socioeconomical factors also tying into this? Yet this part of AI never losing concentration, it also speaks to what I hear from another project I'm part of to get with emergency doctors where they speak about decision supports tool that doesn't get tired at the end of the shift or in the middle of the night, you know, doesn't get affected by the stress. Um, and kind of the, the perceived qualities that these kinds of decision supports can help with. But one thing that is particular also when we talk about medical screening is that we have a presumed healthy population and we apply technologies to try to figure out, um, to try to find disease, you know, and we don't want to miss a cancer, but of course we also don't want to flag something as cancer when it's not due to the resources it takes to investigate that, of course, but foremost due to the anxiety it creates for a person thinking they might have cancer where they don't. And that means that we also have to keep the false positives in check. And that could also mean an increased interpretation load for the radiologist. So all these kinds of changes are important to keep in mind. But one thing that also stood out in this survey was the uncertainties about responsibilities. What, what kind of responsibilities do the AI developers have and uh, how much responsibilities are the medical professionals still, uh, are, how much do they control this situation and how can they be, still be liable? And they also wanted to be involved in the design, development and implementation of AI, or at least know the other breast radiologists were. And this speaks to the idea of the human in the loop, which is often talked about when we talk about like AI development and tech development. And when we talk about AI in medicine, it's often referred to as the doctor in the loop or the radiologist in the loop. And of course, when we talk about medicine, the, the, the clinicians tend to still be liable for the medical decision making. So it also has safety or legal reasons keeping uh, human um, in the loop, checking the outputs from the machine learning systems. But I think we also need to talk about like what, when we use these kinds of concepts, what human are we referring to? What about the patients? What about the clinicians? What do you think, what do we want this kind of humans to be performing as critical judgment? And also what is included in this loop? It's also often kind of a narrow idea about taking a system and putting it just into the setting, which is quite complex socio-technical setting. So I think we need to care also for this loop in AI development uh, beyond this narrow idea of the loop and the human. Because much of AI systems are talked about as being uh, unfulfilled opportunities due to the ethical and human-centered challenges that still exist. And that means that we have to talk about what is 
in the glitch between the development of medical AI and successful responsible implementations in the clinic. There are a lot of issues still, of course. Um, we have examples of equity issues, such as applications performed poorly on dark skin, for example. We have the issue of opacity, how opaque can systems be and medical professionals still be liable for the decision making. And the issue of trust. This is often described as a kind of a missing component here, that medical professionals need to trust the systems before we can put them into use. And also the question of augmentation and like how much can we augment decision making and assist decision making until we make the humans merely operators of technically made decisions. So I think we need to keep an eye on this potentially new uh, agency landscape that this is creating. And technology is often framed as these kinds of opposing values that we can have patient data privacy, but then we lack enough of health data that we need to make the models, or that we can increase the explainability or interpretability of models, but then we lose models performance that we want for patient outcomes. But I would argue that these are false opposites or should be treated as such. Another false binary is pointed out by the researcher Francis Lee. He speaks about the notion of AI or algorithmic system as being either transparent or opaque. When we're, what we actually are having is this kind of different translucencies depending on we, who we are in these socio-technical settings. Uh, and we also talk about, or tend to talk about trust in AI in this way. When we talk about medical AI, we don't want blind trust in that. That would be dangerous. But we also don't want mistrust, or rather, if we mistrust the systems, it shouldn't be used. So what we want is more of a constant, critical engagement and trust calibration. But these kinds of thinking into opposites or binaries, such as putting medical ethics in one corner and kind of a AI amplified healthcare in another, it favors certain interests, and we should stop feeding those kind of opposites. And instead, we need to realize that we need them both, or that we need to be in, in these often uncomfortable places and spaces in between. And as a critical social scientist looking into technology, I often get the sense or the feeling that we're sometimes being seen as a nuisance or kind of a roadblock to these roads to AI success or as being pessimist about technology. Uh, but I would argue that it's often the opposite and we should start framing it as such. You know, uh, the ones talking about the flaws and being critical towards technology are often the ones dreaming about bigger, bigger, better things such as just societies and equal health for all. And I would urge you to keep dreaming of that AI-assisted, amplified, caring future of healthcare. But that also means that we have to be aware of these kinds of agency and responsibility displacements that could happen in this space. And it also means that we shouldn't settle for technology that are in different ways undermining the standings of medical ethics or of the common good. And that could also mean that we have to move slowly and thoughtful and not fast and break things. Thank you.